So, Father, I just thank you so much for this study of Revelation. And, and uh, the first thing that I thank you for, Father, is that um, you've just given us tremendous peace because we recognize that what we are viewing is the future history, the things that are going to happen, things that are yet to come, that all we can really do is open up our ears and our eyes and our hearts to hear, see, and understand so that uh, we have the information needed to communicate these things if we're called upon to do so. And that we also have the opportunity to uh, look at our own lives and see where do I line up? What am I doing? And, and what is my responsibility uh, to my family and those around me? And so, Father, I just thank you that you chose to reveal these truths to us, that you have done this since the very beginning of time. I think about how long it was when Daniel was written. And later on, when we get into Isaiah passages and Jeremiah passages and all these other scriptures that we're going to be looking at, how clear you were throughout all time as to what your plans and purposes were and that one day you would take into account the sins of mankind and judge. And so uh, I thank you that you're just and you're true and you are righteous and you are good. Help us to understand clearly what we are going to be talking about today. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I went to the store and I bought some different colored markers that are going to be dark so that hopefully we can see them. And uh, so... We're going to start with Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And so um, let me get to the right page. You can't see me? Okay, I'm going to back up. Thank you for telling me. Okay, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. So it says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So if you are a charting person, you should have, this is like a laundry list, one through six, six things that he talks about in verse 24 that you should identify as six separate things. Verse 25, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, to, the restore, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. That's just as clear as we could put, right? So do you, do you, uh, I think, Marty, you're probably the only one in here that did Zachariah. So we see that reference in there, the wing of abomination is a reference to Zacharias, the woman in the basket with the two storks that fly her to the plain of Shinar. That's, that's referring to that. So as well as other things, which is, you know, pretty interesting. Okay, so we're going to look at Daniel 9, 24 through 27. So we see that there are seven weeks. Now, and then there's 62 weeks, and then one week. This totals to 70 weeks. So a week is equivalent to a year. So this is 49 years. This is 434 years, this is seven years. 
and this equals to how many? 400, 490 years. Now, we're gonna be talking about um, some of this again, and we'll probably we'll probably refer to it again in uh, in part four, especially. So I've got some notes here, and we're going to talk about what he's saying when he talks about the six things. So uh, let me draw a different color here. Now that I have options, right? Okay. So the six things that he's talking about here is number one. finish the transgression. Okay, now that word means uh, to bring to a complete stop. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about closing, shut, restrain, he's finishing the transgression. He's going to, that would result to make an end of sin. Now, that means um, conclude, bring to a close. He's going to conclude it. He's going to end it. It's going to come to an end. And then number three is atonement for iniquity. Bring, make atonement for iniquity. And so to atone for iniquity is to, um, atonement means, I thought this is such a great, uh, a great definition. The heroic response from God to cleanse, wipe clean, purify, or purge. So we're just going to say that he's wiping clean iniquity. So what is iniquity? Right, it's twisting, this is the definition, twisting or defacing beyond its intended purpose. The quality of being unrighteous, intended sin. So it is intentional What do these three things have in common? What are they all about? What is, what is the repeated statement here? Trans, transgression, sin, and iniquity. So this is all dealing with sin. So these first three things right here are related to sin. These are sin issues. The next three, I'm going to run out of room here. How did I do that? Bring in everlasting righteousness. I'm going to have to erase this, I think. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, if you're talking about uh, bringing it in, you're coming in with conduct that is right and correct forever. So it's going to bring in conduct that is right, and it is going to be forever. Number five is seal up vision 
and prophecy. So when you are sealing up, uh, it means completing. all prophecy. That's what number five is talking about. And the number six is anoint the most holy place. And when you look at anointing the most holy place, when you anoint something, what are you doing? You, how do they? How did they anoint? How did they anoint king? You're pouring oil and consecr consecrating. So you are consecrating and what is the most holy place? What is the, what is it? It's a place. It is the future temple. Okay. You're consecrating the temple. The future temple. So you see in here, these things that are happening and think about what's going on here. We're going to talk about these, these events through this timeline. Okay. So Finishing transgression. This is related to sin. So this is related to what? Righteousness. He's talking about righteousness here. So there's a division between these two statements. Even though he's talking about three things, there, there's one and then there's the other. And we're going to see how this comes about um, in this timeline, okay? So when we look at these three, where were these three things dealt with? Where? Where on this timeline were they dealt with? Right. Where was all this dealt with? At the cross. Because what did he do? What was the purpose of Jesus's uh, death on the cross? Finish transgression, bring an end of sin, make atonement for inequity. So these three things are talking about the cross and the condition of man really up to the cross. All right. Bringing in everlasting righteousness, sealing up the vision, and anointing the most holy place, that's going to be all the way over here. That's going to be dealt with over here. So when you think about what's being talked about here, it's, it's very important to have a, a much clearer grasp of what's going on. So um, it's, it'll, get really, it'll, get, it'll get more interesting as we go. All right. So um, we see the 70 weeks. The, the other important thing here is that the 70 weeks or 490 years are also defined. Okay. So we're going to start at 605 BC. This is the Babylonian captivity. Now, what happened in the, why did the Babylonian captivity occur? Do we know? Okay, but what was the, what was pro, what, the problem with uh, Judah? Why did they go into captivity? What were they not doing? Think about what was happening to those, uh, to, to Israel at that time. Because they were not what? Okay, no Sabbath rest. 
Now, how does that connect? What is the Sabbath about? Why do we have the Sabbath? Okay. Because what are you doing with the Sabbath? You had the, you, you were resting from your work. You were honoring God. You were put, giving tithe. You were, right? Worshiping God. Okay. Right. So this is Leviticus. I'm going to give you a lots of little scripture. 25, 18 through 23. Leviticus 26. 2, 14 through 18, and 21 through 28, and then also 34 through 35, and then Jeremiah 25, 1 through 12, and 29 7 through 14, and then Daniel 9, 2. All of these things show that for 490 years, they did not honor the Sabbath. So the reason the Babylonian captivity occurred was because God was giving rest to the land because the Babylon that because the Israel did not obey God. So this is going to be 70 years of captivity. That's a very important thing, right? 70 years they were going to be captive. And that's what Daniel 9 talks about. So he tells them, nope, you're not going to do, you're not going to be in this land anymore. You're going to lose everything because you're not honoring me. So when we think about, and also when we got into Hebrews, what was it that we learned in Hebrews about the Sabbath rest? What was it a picture of? If you were having rest in the, in, in the Sabbath, then you are in God's will, Right. What is the ultimate rest of the believer? Exactly. So what is the picture supposed to be like on earth regarding that? Isn't it just another type, right? So the Sabbath rest was something that God was teaching. We learned it in Hebrews that God was really teaching them, teaching his people how to worship him. And the problem that Israel always had is they kept changing how they wanted to worship God. They wanted to make God in their own image. And God said, nope, I'm God. There's no one like me, no one beside me, and I'm going to uphold my law. Okay? So the consequence of the Babylonian captivity, and that's why I'm giving you all these verses, is they did not honor the Sabbath rest for 490 years, which is equivalent to what's going on here. So this is 538 BC. This is when um, they've, they're at 67 years in their captivity. And Daniel is 82. He's 82 years old. Now, do you remember what happened in 538, Ezra? Ezra, Nehemiah, and all that? They, are, they have returned. They're rebuilding the temple. Okay, so that's happening. They're rebuilding the temple. So then we see 49, 445. This is Nehemiah. This is Nehemiah 2, 5 through 8. And what is he doing? It is the decree to rebuild the wall.
what is this talk about? Um, when we're looking at Daniel 20, uh, 9, 24, it says, verse 25, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So doing this has been decreed in Daniel 9, 25. It is not the temple. This is rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. So from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, right? Who is to come and will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Did that happen? It did. When did that happen? AD 70. So that is. Okay. Daniel. 9.25. The temple. Destroyed. Okay. All right. So this, from this point, let me get a different color. Just let me know when your brain start, starts hurting and you want me to stop for a minute, okay? <laughs> so from 605, from this point up until, I got the wrong chart. I'm gonna make sure I'm doing it right. From this point up until the cross right here, is actually 434 years. Okay. This is in that group. This takes 49 years right there. So this is how many weeks we are at now at this point at the cross, 69 weeks. Okay. And one of the things that amazes me about this is how precise this is. Now we're talking Jewish history, Jewish 360 days, not 365. So the time is a little different from the Julian cal calendar, but he, God is talking from Leviticus. Okay. So in the, in, in Exodus from Exodus chapter 12 to chapter 19. So chapter 19 in Exodus is when the law is given. Okay. Moses goes up on the mountain, gets the law. From 12 to 19 is only 50 days, plus one, plus one, 50 plus one day. It's only 50 days. After he gets the law, then comes Leviticus. Leviticus only covers 30 days. And what was given to them in Leviticus? The law, the order of worship how to sacrifice, how to wear your robe, when to do fire, when, you know, do all those things. So how to set up your camp, where the tribes are going to be, all of these things, right? So he is initiating exactly, let's say, 90 days, 100 days after they leave Egypt, what is God initiating? The Jewish society, how to behave how to live, how to please God, what he likes, what he doesn't like, what he wants, what he doesn't want. So from the beginning, they were taught the Sabbath rest. And God was showing them that for the purpose of teaching them, who do you rest in? It was really about the person of Christ. Really, ultimately, that's what it's about. The only means, because we've got transgression, sin, and iniquity to deal with. And it cannot be dealt with until the cross. Okay? It just can't be because there's nobody acceptable. But from 90 days 
to the cross, right? Because they become a nation when they leave Egypt. From that point forward, all of this time is being spent preparing them for the cross. Did the cross have to happen no matter how good or how bad Israel was? So it isn't about their works making them approved for God. What was the purpose of the works that he did in the temple and all the things that God was doing? What was the purpose? Ultimately, what did God want for them to know? What did the law show them? That you're never good enough. And so when they were sacrificing and doing all of these things, what was God teaching them about their ability to save themselves? Only God can save them. So if they had followed the law, if they had kept the Sabbath rest, would they have been able to recognize their Messiah? It would seem so, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. Uh, exactly exactly we cannot change ourselves we have to have a messiah we have to have a savior we have to have a person who deals with our sin and then brings righteousness yeah exactly Right. Where are all these verses coming from? The Old Testament. And what is God teaching them in the very beginning? I am the only one who can deliver you from your sin. Okay? And, and how did we get there? What happened in Genesis? Yeah, we, the fall. I had a really great conversation with somebody that I really respect who uh, was having, is having some, um, uh, doesn't really believe in, in um, what's the word I'm trying to say, uh, that, uh, that the predetermined will of God, that uh, he knows who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. And that, you know, because there are certain things in scripture that talk about uh, Jude, for instance, Jude 1, 4 says, these persons have been long marked out beforehand for this condemnation. There's all kinds of references to people and we see it in Revelation. We know that there are people who take the mark of the beast and they will not be saved, period. Not going to happen. And so, um, uh, you know, his discussion was, well, you know, how do you have this predetermined will of God that these people are going to hell and these people are not going to hell? And so what I said was that it's a misunderstanding of what is predestination. So God, before the tree, I mean, before they ate of the tree, what did he tell Adam and Eve? Do not eat of the tree or you will die. Okay. So that is predetermined consequence for what will happen if you do that. Does that mean that God set up Adam and Eve to, do, to sin? Of course not. It is, and so when we look at th these things that we're listing here, God said in Deuteronomy, today I put before you life and death. If you choose life, you will live. You'll be blessed. I'll take care of you. Blessing and curse, that is God making the stand before you have sinned, that this is the consequence for your sin. And if you sin, this is what's going to happen to you. Does God want people to sin? No, but that's what predestination is meaning, something that has been announced beforehand, what the consequence is going to be should you do it. And we know that throughout the Old Testament, how did people get saved? People got saved in the Old Testament, didn't they? What did they have to believe? They looked forward to the cross. Uh, Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, believed God and was called righteous. 
Isn't that the definition of righteousness? So he didn't know Jesus of Mary and Joseph, that particular guy that we see on the chosen. I'm just using that. But he, but he knew that the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one who's going to take care of his sin was coming and he believed in the coming of the Messiah. And so when Jesus died on the cross, we all talk about it. What did he do? He went down and preached to the, cap, to the captives. Now, who are the captives? Those who are on the cool side of Hades who are waiting to be delivered. Jesus is the first fruits, right? They can't go to heaven before him. So he went down, took those people, preached to them. Who saw that? According to Luke 16, the people on the other side of the gulf got to see it, right? Because they can see the cool side. The cool side can't see them because God's merciful. But they could see the declaration. And don't you think you would hope that they would say, oh, I'm sorry. But what do you think they did? Curse you, God, for leaving me in this hell. So this is all the timeline, the 434 years. And then we have the church age we're going to talk about here. And so I'm looking at my numbers and making sure my numbers are right. Okay. 49, 49 and 434. Did I do that right? The 490 minus seven would be 483 is what it is. 483 years. Let me mess up your, your chart. Sorry. 483. Uh, uh, uh. I knew there was something wrong with that. This is 434 years through here. Okay. So the decree to rebuild the wall, we see that. And then we have this gap here. Now, I think, did you guys in your homework have a chart of the statue? Okay. And, and when we looked at this, the statue chart, what did we see? What was, what was going on with this statue chart? Let me get there. Okay, now this is going to be, this is the statue chart, and we see these four kingdoms. We will be talking a lot more about this chart. And then we see that there is a period of time, a gap, and then we see the last seven years here. Now this gap of time, and there's some other information they put in there. Yeah, in that, in the 10 kings, the three and a half years and the three and a half years and all that. So we see all that. And, and maybe if you don't have this in your book, um, uh, send this out too. I'm gonna, I'll give you this to, to scan. So, so we see this prophetic overview of Daniel and uh, we see the Ancient of Days comes, the 10 kings, the iron and clay mixed together, which is representing the 10 kings that are talked about in Revelation. And so we see that there is a gap and this gap right here is called from here to here, the church age. Something very important to understand is that all of this Old Testament stuff, including Daniel, had no reference and had no understanding of Gentile saints, okay, of Christianity. There was no teaching of that. There was an understanding from Daniel's perspective of the uh, deliverance from sin, okay, them being changed. And when Jan Daniel 12 talks about the saints of the Holy One or the saints of the highest one, he's talking about Jews. He's not talking about Gentiles. So he doesn't really understand that. But we, we recognize that uh, this church age, there this is this gap that has to do with the, um, the Gentile church, the Christians. So this is one of the other reasons why there is not much understanding about the rapture in the Old Testament. Okay, because does the rapture have anything to do with Israel?
Is it, is it, is it about it? Messianic Jews, yes, but, but is it about that? It's not. What is the rapture for? The church. So the rapture that we're talking about right here is about the church. It's not about the uh, Jews. I'm sorry, you guys are looking at this online, can't read that, but that says rapture up there. Okay, so let's, let's, let's review and let's think about what we've got so far. We see the Daniel 9, 24 through 27 is talking about the, the conditions of all mankind up to the cross. Okay, now there's a change. Now we have the law is no longer in stone tablets. Jeremiah 31, the law is now written on your heart. You're a new creation in Christ. And we have this church age that occurs here. Now, the temple was destroyed for what reason? Exactly. So the temple had to be taken out because God has replaced the temple with salvation, which is what everlasting salvation has to do with, right? The cross is the thing that deals with transgression and salvation. Now, here's an interesting thing. It says, bring in everlasting righteousness. Does the cross bring in everlasting righteousness? Okay. If you're saved, if you are a new creation in Christ, can you unmake your salvation? You cannot. You can walk away. You can do, you know, then we might say that by the time we get to the place of uh, standing before the Lord, if you really were not saved, that's when we'll know those that, you know. But your, your, the sin issue has been dealt with at the cross. It does bring everlasting righteousness. Does it seal up prophecy and vision or does it complete all prophecy? This is an interesting question to me. Right? Right? What would they be prophesying about? No need for the temple. Okay. So the prophecy regarding Christ has been sealed up. It is, but that has been completed, right? Because Christ is not, what did he do? He went to the right hand of the father and he sat down. His work is finished. When he comes back and uh, chapter 19 of Revelation, he is coming to execute the final cleansing, right? Of the earth and anointing the most holy place. Does that happen yet? No, but conduct that is right is being brought in through the church but then the church is taken out of the way and who's left now men are left but i'm saying who is it who is revelation going to be dealing with israel right so this is really about judging the judgment of Israel. Now, are there unbelieving Gentiles? Obviously, uh, obviously, that's not, we're not we're not discounting that. But it's important to recognize what's being talked about here. Let me get back to my little chart here and see how this all fits together. So, Matthew twenty four. 6 through 14, and we've talked about some of this. And 24 through 26, I think are referring to some of this. Sacrifice is stopped. Now, 
no more sacrifice. So then we have the rapture that occurs right here. And then this initiates, this is the initiation of the last week. This is the 70th week, seven years, okay? So it's three and a half and three and a half. Three and a half years each. This first part is the two, we talked about it, two witnesses. And then the second half is Israel or the woman. Okay. And what gets built here? I'm going to put it right here. He's, it's already been completed. And here's the temple again. And what is so interesting is in this middle, sacrifice stopped. Now let's look at... Um, Second Thessalonians. Right, it's this, it was started there. So it was started, they started doing construction right here. So temple construction. I think the temple construction probably ended like somewhere right here and, and the temple was built about in the midpoint, it was done. So temple construction, all right. Second Thessalonians 2, one through 12. Now we request you brethren with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the rapture right there, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now, I do want to make a list about the day of the Lord, and I'm going to do that right here. I want that on there. Okay. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. This is Second Thessalonians 2. Three through four. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. What's taken out of the way? In, the, in, in, in this point. What's taken out of the way with the rapture? The church. Okay, so this is Second Thessalonians two seven. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with his breath, with the breath of his mouth. So, when uh, the church is taken out of the way, the temple construction has begun. Somewhere in the midpoint of that first three and a half years, the temple's completed and they are practicing uh, sacrifices and they're worshiping in the temple until the midpoint of this, of the tribulation. That is the one who's coming is in accord with the activity, this is verse nine, of Satan with all power and signs and false wonder. So this guy, the Antichrist, 
will have power, signs, and false wonders. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. In order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. So what does it say? God sends a deluding spirit. He blinds them so that they will believe uh, what is false. Okay. Now, did did they start off? Did did uh, it start off that way? Okay, it did not. Now let's look really quickly at Daniel eleven. I want to get to that little part there. Daniel eleven thirty six through twelve thirteen. So I'm going to erase some of this stuff over here, and we're going to talk about that. I actually move this over and just set it next to there. Okay. Yes. That there. In other words, do you remember when Pharaoh uh, uh, kept changing his mind, like that Moses would come to him, and and it says that an evil spirit came upon him. In other words, he did not want to believe, so God accommodated him and made sure he did not believe. God did not create, create uh, delusion, but he did allow it to happen because that's what the king wanted. And that's who's another guy that we see that happened? King Saul, 1215, yeah, 1213. Okay, so. So does God allow this kind of stuff to happen? Uh, yes, he does. All right. So we're not going to spend a whole ton, ton of time about this, but we're going to look at it. So Daniel 11.35, some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time, because it is still to come at the appointed time. So he's talking about there are going to be people who are going to die. Uh, he's not talking so much. He, he could be referring to this point here or throughout the whole tribulation. But then verse 36 says the king will do what? Will do as he pleases. What are some of the things that he will do? He's going to tell, he's going to exalt and magnify himself above every God and will do what? That's a very strong word. Speaking monstrous things against God. And he will prosper until the indignation is finished for that which is decreed will be done. Another term of decree. So he is going to have success, right? Until it's over at the end. 
Now, this is something else that I thought was really interesting about him. He will show no regard for the gods of his father or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. So what is he? Uh, he's not going to be excited about women. You're not going to care about that. I'm not saying whether he's got women or not. I, that's not the point. He is not going to be a typical guy like they saw in the past. These kings that were here and really from the very beginning were a totally different kind of king than what he's going to be. But what is he going to honor? He's going to honor a God of fortresses, a God whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasure. And 39 says, he will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign God. He will give great honor to those who acknowledge him and will cause him to rule over the many and will parcel out land for a price. All right, we just, I just, just want to stop here for just a second. Who do you think the foreign God is? Who do you think the foreign God that his fathers did not know? That men before him didn't recognize as God? It's the honor, I think, of Satan. Because I think that when this happens here in the middle, this is Daniel 11, 38, and 39. 38 and 39. Little line in there. Because he is, who, where is he getting his power? Where is this king getting his authority and his ability? At the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. He will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. He will also enter the beautiful land. What's the beautiful land? Right. And many countries will fall, but they, these will be rescued out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Okay, where is Edom and Moab? That's right. The remnant, he cannot overcome Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. He will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. The Libyans, the Ethiopians will follow at his heels, but rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain, and yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. What do you think that's talking about? Exactly. So we're talking about when Jesus comes back, Daniel 11, 45. Twelve one. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who's found written in the books will be rescued. That is definitely talking about this time. Many of those who, is, who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake and these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. All right. What is that talking about? but not this rapture, the second rapture. I don't know. Well, many of those who sleep will awake and these to everlasting life. He's talking about the tribulation saints that over here, because down here uh, in, in, in uh, I'm trying to figure out how to draw this in here. In Revelation 20, we see those who are uh, uh, raptured or 
called up are the tribulation saints. And they have, and they're raptured. Okay. So that is talking about Daniel 12. Um, I guess I'm going to say one through three. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now that also could be talking about the great white throne. And I'm just going to say Daniel 12, um, two is because that is the only resurrection of those who go to the lake of fire, L O F lake of fire that happens at the great white throne judgment. So those who are righteous are going to be that have come out of the tribulation that the, the seven years are going to be raptured and they're going to rule and reign with Jesus for the thousand year. This is the thousand year reign. The ones that, that did not believe they're going to only be resurrected one time, the sheep and the goats, and they're going to stand before the great white throne judgment at the very end of that thousand years. And they're going to the lake of fire. They will remain. They will remain. There's only one time. See, here's the important thing. This is the thing that's so amazing to me. There's only one time that God executes judgment. And it's going to have to be at the end of this thousand years. Why? Because what happens in the thousand years, there is a battle of Gog and Magog. And what happens there? The unrighteous are judged and those people are going to come and stand before the throne only one time does god do a judgment that sends people to the lake of fire so at the end of that thousand years after the battle of gog and magog god himself they stand before him those sheep on one side the goats on the other who's going to be standing there watching all that happen everybody all the saints, because we're going to be in glorified bodies. We're really moving way past this, this week's lesson. <laughs> we're way, way past that. So, but yes, so there is a tremendous uh, uh, statement here in verse three. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the army, uh, lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And then he says something really interesting. He says, but as for you, and who's talking here? Michael, right? But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and fill up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Is that going on now? Is this being fulfilled now? Yes. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others were standing, one to this bank and the other on, on that bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river? How long will it be until the end of these wonders? I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. Hmm. That's interesting. That's three and a half years. Which three and a half years? <laughs> okay. He said, as for me, I heard, but I could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged purified and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. From the time of the regular, from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there'll be 1290 days. What's he talking about? Second three and a half, second three and a half. From the regular sacrifice is abolished 
and the abomination of desolation is set up. So that's the second three and a half years. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1335 days. So there is a gap of about 30 days right here. We don't know exactly what that is, but that's something because it says, how blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1335 days. As for you, go your way to the end and you will enter into rest and rise again from your allotted portion at the end of the age. Okay. Yes. Yes. Right? Of course. Okay. Yes. Okay. No. Because in the thousand, and, and we are definitely going to talk about more, but you know, I, I have just come to the conclusion that it's, we can talk about it now, but then we're going to talk about it again and again and again, because, you know, it is complicated. <laughs> okay. It's not easy to understand, but in this thousand years, this is Zechariah chapters 12, 13, and 14. It talks about the thousand year millennial reign and what that's going to be like. Okay. And in that thousand years, there are going to be people that come that we've got the, the uh, Battle of Armageddon right here. And then there's going to be 30 days after that. I'm not really sure what's going to be going on or 30 days after this. It might be this. Anyway, then we, the people that are alive during that time that survive because is the army 100 percent of all the people who live on the earth. Is every single person who lives on the earth going to show up at the campaign of Armageddon? No. The armies are going to show. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be millions and millions and millions, but it's not going to be every single person. And we're going to study that. We're going to look at that thousand year reign later, but there will be people who come in and there's still going to be one sacrifice, the Feast of Booths, that will still continue during that thousand years. And what were... And that, Really, Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles. There were three major feasts, okay? There was the um, Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Booths. Jesus fulfilled Passover at the cross. Acts chapter 2 fulfilled Pentecost because now the law is written on your hearts and no longer on stone tablets. The third one, which is Feast of Booths, will be completed right over here at the end of this. Now, what was the purpose of the feast? And what, why, why, did, why did God install feasts? What did they do? Celebration of history, but what did, what did Passover teach you? Okay, but just all the feasts. The Passover was teaching us what? There had to be a sacrifice for sin. Okay. Pentecost was about the giving of the law. 50 days after Passover came Pentecost. And, and, and uh, Moses went up the mountain, right? Came down with the Ten Commandments. And what did God say? What do the Ten Commandments represent? Okay, what does the law represent? God. It is who God is. Now, they had to sacrifice because they could not meet the standards that the law required without some sort of sacrifice. Okay. So when Pentecost came, and this is another great misunderstanding about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What did the Holy Spirit do? When the Holy Spirit came upon the 70, 120 in the room, what, what, did, what happened to all of them? In the upper room in Acts chapter two. What, what happened? Okay, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They had, they had tongues of fire. They started speaking in other tongues that everybody else could understand. They're speaking in other languages, right? And what happened as a result of that? 
they were filled with power to go speak the gospel. That's what the church age is. It is the representation. What does the church represent? Fulfillment of the sacrifice of the lamb, fulfillment of the of Pentecost in us. So now we are the, it says, what is it the uh, uh, Corinthians says? Your body is the temple of God. Why do you not need a temple anymore? Right? You are the temple. So that is what those two feasts are fulfilling. Why do we have the third feast in, in this period of time? Because there are people who live. Now, I, I mean, to me, I'm like, dude, come on now. Just like we always say, I would never, I would believe in Jesus if I lived in that day. But there are millions of people who live on the earth who are not saved. Now, who's on the, I, I'm just going to make this, watch my time. Who's on the, on the, in this thousand years, who's on the earth? Jesus, saints that are uh, glorified, right? There's glorified saints, angels, right? Um, who else would be on there? Angels, glorified saints. Oh, David. David will be ruling over Israel. All these people and then men who come through and then those who are born after. All of these groups of people are on the earth. And they're all, and look, you see an angels. Angels are walking around. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, uh, we're going to be there as the, as the saints of God. We're going to be on the earth, right? Who's going to rule and reign with them? It says that the tribulation saints that are raptured here, they have the right to rule with Jesus in the thousand years because uh, they have gone through the tribulation. The people that are coming out of the tribulation are the ones that are going to see the tribulation saints. That's what that is a picture of. Now, one of the other reasons why the thousand years even occurs, because I was like, you know, why can't it be done right here? Let's go. Because of Genesis 12, one through three, God promised land, seed, and a nation, and no time in history until this thousand years does Israel occupy 100% of the promised land. So this is fulfilling this prophecy right here. 100% of the land will be uh, ruled by Israel. That's why you have the thousand year reign. Now, I guess people are having children and not everybody that is born believes there's going to be unbelievers there because we have the battle of Gog and Magog down here, right? But this is one, this is the reason for the millennial reign. Now, he also talks about it in Zechariah and Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah. It is talking about that reign and rule also. So God has already planned. This is the thing about God. Predestination or predetermined facts of God have to do with we had that list of the prophecy being fulfilled, all the prophecy coming to an end. Really, at the birth of Christ, that is the fulfillment of all prophecy. The execution of the fulfillment of all prophecy is later. Okay? But he fulfilled it. He, he fulfilled it all. And he's going to reveal that when he comes back down in the uh, Battle of Armageddon. Okay. Let me get back to my little chart here so I can try to finish it. I got to on a mission on a mission okay so the abominations of desolation is right here huh okay just throwing it around okay the abomination of desolation is here and it is also the apostasy So this is another thing that I really, this is kind of a, mm, I'm going to put the apostasy up here. I'm really messing up your chart and I apologize. Temple construction is the apostasy. 
Why is that the apostasy? Yep. Why? Exactly. Why did God destroy the temple in AD 70? No need for sacrifice anymore. It's been fulfilled. But the apostasy, see, is there apostasy on the earth today? Of course there is. But you see, when we're talking about this in, in, in 2 Thessalonians, when he says, uh, let's see. Let's see. Verse three, let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. This is a specific apostasy has to come and the law man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction because what does he do? He walks in and takes his seat in the temple of God. Why are the two witnesses standing against this apostasy? What is their job? What are the two witnesses doing here? They're de he's declaring, people, you don't understand. There is no need for sacrifice anymore. And when the man of lawlessness walks in, he poses at all other gods, displays himself in verse 4, takes a seat in the temple, displaying himself as being God. So the apostasy is not just apostasy on the earth it is a specific thing that is a sign of because in the first three and a half years do they really know the antichrist is who he says he is he's some kind of savior he is he is like taking over and you know and fixing everything okay so we don't recognize until he walks in there, huh? Yes, absolutely they do. Because what is he doing in chapter 13? He, it's, the, the, uh, it's the dragon, beast one, and beast two, the unholy trinity. That's happening, happening, and that happens right here in this middle point. He's just a man until he takes the power of Satan. All right, so is there anything else that I can tell you? The day of the Lord, I just want to write this down. The day of the Lord is talking, talked about in Matthew 24, 27 through 31, 36, 37 through 42. Daniel. 727. And we know from 37 through 42, no man knows the hour. Okay. Any questions? I'm so impressed with myself. I got through it. Yay. Let me give you that too. And she's going to send you this. I And I gave in this. Uh, oh, okay. Let me give that to you. The statue chart. Okay, so everybody got a headache now. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. My brain is full too, and I don't know that it's a good thing. <laughs> uh, I I love the uh, I love the study of Revelation, but it's also really really can become very weary, you know, because it is a lot. But what does this tell us? Really, ultimately, what do we learn about God? And 
the thing is, this, his plan does not change. And in addition to all of that, it's so exacting. It's so precise. Um, we, I think the only other study I've ever done that really kind of put the whole Bible together for me was Kings and Prophets. That's probably what I'm going to teach next is Kings and Prophets. Because in Kings and Prophets, you see each individual king, who he ruled, who his enemies were, who the prophet was that spoke to him. And you see them in successive order. So you get an understanding of the flow of the nation of Israel and what happened to them and why things happened the way they did. It was a very, very good study for me to, to do. The other study that does that type of thing is Revelation, because Revelation really shows us how soon God started talking about the end. When he when's the very first prophecy in the Bible is Genesis 3, when the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. What is that talking about? The cross right there, the very first prophecy. And that to me uh, is like all of this. If we just started from that verse and started laying out, I, I mean, I know that people have done it. I, I haven't done that yet, but I, I, I'm hoping for the day when I can do that. But to lay out in order, in a, a, a sequential order, uh, these prophecies and how they land, you know, wouldn't that be fantastic to do that? I mean, I don't know how many boards you'd need in this room. You need the, all the wall, you know, it'd be crazy. Is there any other questions that we want to talk about? Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> yes. Because that's a great question. We, we ce they celebrate Feast of Booths because all of these people need to have some method of, of, of uh, equating their sins to consequence. If they don't believe in Jesus as their Savior and have salvation, then they're still held under the law. The law has not been abolished yet. Abolished. Right. Delivered them from sin. Egypt is the picture of sin. They had to do the Feast of Booths as a reminder of being delivered from sin, the sin of Egypt in the thousand year reign. We'll talk about, we're going to specific down here. It's going to be throughout the entire thing. They're going to institute. That's fantastic right right that's awesome right that's awesome works for me so so the thing to to understand about all of this is that Indeed, you know, God has made a contingency plan for everything. There's nothing that God isn't going to. And he wants us to understand just just like in every other. This will be a harder one to teach. Next week is going to be hard. Um, and it's because. What is still on the earth? Remember, we made that list of Daniel nine. What's still on the earth here? Sin. Sin is still uh, occurring, has to be dealt with, and then there will be no more. He will complete that and deal with that. Daniel 11 is great because it really, and there's so many more. My list for Daniel 11 is hugely long of the things talking about that king. It's, it's a pretty sobering idea of what, what he, he does and how little concern he has for anything except absolute power. Okay, well. Let's pray. I pray for rest in your brains. Rest the brain. There you go. 
Father, we just thank you so much for, uh, wow, would you, I think we got through it pretty well today. And I thank you, Father, for what you've done. We look forward to the time when we will stand in your presence. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you're going to take us out of the way that we are the restrainer. And Father, when I think about being the restrainer of sin, I have to ask myself, am I able to be the witness and the light that is needed? I ask you to help us to be strong in our faith restraining against the sin that father it might require some things of us that we haven't thought of before it might require a stance that we have to make it might require us to look at our lives in a way that we've never looked at our lives before but you have promised us that that even our service to you has an end date you have a time that you have set, and only you know what that time is. And one day we will be in your presence, and from heaven we will be rejoicing, glorifying in your name, and watching your will be performed on earth. I pray for all of our unsaved loved ones, for those that we know do not know you. And I ask you, Father, to help them come to that place of salvation. I pray for our country because our country is running headlong into the foolishness of men. And Lord, we, we so desperately want to see righteousness on this earth. But Father, you, just, you, you have explained to us over and over and over again, the only truly righteous one is Jesus Christ. And we are only made righteous because of his gift of salvation. And so, Father, we need to look to you and look to your promises and trust that you are the one who intervenes on behalf of your own children, those whom you call by the name of your son. We are Christians. We are little Christ. And so I just thank you, Father, as you build us into that faith. And strengthen us, Lord, to honor you. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.